Shalom. Uh, welcome. I'm Rabbi Scott with Beth Yeshua Messianic Synagogue in Fort Myers, Florida. We are reissuing the Revelation series that was taught by Rabbi Jim Pickens here at Beth Yeshua over the course of the last two years or so. We feel these messages are especially relevant in these tumultuous times, and we hope and pray that Adonai uses them uh, to strengthen you uh, and, and to encourage you. If you are currently a supporter of this ministry, we would like to say thank you. We appreciate your partnership with us as we all labor together in the work of the gospel of Yeshua uh, in the kingdom here on earth. Uh, if you would like to support us, you will find a link uh, below in uh, the video description. Once again, uh, we hope uh, that this is a blessing to you. If you have any questions, you will find an email address. Uh, if you have any dialogue or discussion, you'll find an email address in the video description below. Please reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, now uh, I will give you the Revelation series with Rabbi Jim Pickens. Shalom. All right. Tonight we pick up our study in Revelation chapter 4, verse 4. We're moving right along at our usual breathtaking speed. Tonight my intention is to get us all the way through verse 7. What we're going to look at tonight should help uh, bring more clarity to last week's lesson as well because we're going to go back and look at a few more things and then as we move forward into verse 4 it will sort of help sort out the, those first three verses we looked at last week. I want to start out by reminding us what this chapter really is all about. It's telling us, in essence, that when we get to the end of the age, we get to the final portion of um, the time before the Lord's return, it tells us that Adonai, God, is fully in charge. He's going to be fully in charge. That God is going to be the supreme authority. God has many attributes. God is love. He's all-knowing. He's omnipresent. God has many attributes, but the one focused on here is his supreme authority. reason for this is the people that this is being written to, particularly the people that will be alive at the end of the age, will have to live through what's being laid out in the rest of the book of the Revelation. They need the information of this chapter so that they will know that whatever happens to them, based on what's laid out for us in the rest of the book of Revelation, God is in complete control. Nothing is taking place that's not within God's will and purpose, and it's been predetermined that these things will happen. Everything that we're going to be looking at from here on is going to happen. We have to keep that point in mind. That's why we're being told these things really in chapter 4. It's preparing us to have a perspective on the rest of the book. If we remember from the first three verses, John was taken to heaven in the Spirit. And God's decided to reveal himself and these matters to him, to John. John sees someone sitting on a throne. John sees someone sitting on a throne. We'll get back to that word someone in a, in a minute or two. It's very interesting why that word someone is used in this. But anyhow, someone is sitting on a throne. Light is being emitted through precious stones, giving the light a color. The throne is surrounded by a rainbow that is shining like an emerald. Now, the description goes further when we get into uh, verse 4. So let's start with that Revelation 4.4, 4, please. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and on the thrones sat 24 elders dressed in white clothing and wearing gold crowns on their heads. So the question becomes almost immediately in our minds, who are these 24 elders? Great debate has gone on as to who these are, and great differences of opinion have been given. There, I'm going to give you some of these opinions for your consideration, just who these 24 elders were. Number one, the word for elder 
is used 12 times in the book of Revelation and only used in conjunction with there being 24 of them. Each used 12 times, and every time it's used, there's 24 of them, elders. Some believe these are the older men who were the tribal leaders of Israel from back in ancient days. Number two, some believe these are in reference to the priesthood, the house of Aaron in ancient Israel, the priesthood divided into 24 divisions. So this group of 24 elders would be representative of the entire priesthood and also the entire nation of Israel if the entire priesthood is represented. So some support for that theory because these 24 elders have white clothing and gold crowns. The priests wore white and the high priest had a gold mitre on his head covering. But we have to note that the white clothing and the gold crowns were not exclusive to the priesthood. Number three, some believe that these are the founders of the 12 tribes of Israel, Reuben through Benjamin, plus the 12 Talmudim or disciples of Yeshua. That's an interesting thought, or a couple of interesting thoughts really go with those. If these included the 12 disciples, John would have seen himself sitting there because he was one of the twelve. I think if I saw myself sitting there, I might make mention of it. And he didn't bother to do that. Then the question arises: who would be the twelfth disciple there? Who would be the twelfth disciple? Would it be Matthew, who the disciples elected to replace Judas Iscariot? Or would it be Saul, the rabbi Paul, Saul of Tarsus, who encountered Yeshua on the road to Damascus and became a disciple to the Gentiles. Interesting thoughts. Number four. One of the least accepted theories is that it was a special group of angels. And there are several problems with that. First problem, nowhere else in Scripture are angels said to occupy thrones. They don't rule, they serve. Number two, nowhere in Scripture are crowns ascribed to angels. Number three, angels have never been referred to as elders in any Scriptures. Then the fifth thing that we look at is some believe that the 24 elders are glorified saints. There are some that hold that these 24 elders are glorified saints from both the time before Yeshua and the time after Yeshua. As we go on, we see that they're seated on thrones, and a throne is a symbol of authority. Notice that we have moved outward from the center, totally surrounding the throne in the center, which is the absolute authority, that throne in the center. These other thrones completely encircling that absolute authority. Each elder is dressed in white, which would indicate righteousness. We have that in many passages that white represents righteousness. As an example, let's go to Revelation 19, um, beginning about midway in verse 7, verses 7 and 8. It says, For the time has come for the wedding of the Lamb, and his bride has prepared herself. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen means the righteous deeds of God's people. Fine linen would be white. This is the bride and Messiah. Those that are righteous are dressed in white, the believers. I think I mentioned this before, but when we get here to verse 19, we're going to discover that the Greek word here translated bride in this uh, Bible essentially means wife. Essentially means wife. Another Greek word is used throughout Revelation for bride. We'll expand on that when we get there. Back in Revelation 4.4, 4, we find that these 24 elders also have on their heads crowns of gold. The word for crown here, again, is not one used for a ruler or a sovereign. We've looked into this briefly a couple of times. If it was for a ruler or a sovereign, that would be a diadem, which would indicate political authority. Here the crown is of a victor, it's a Stephanus, that kind of crown that was given to somebody that won a race or some other kind of competition in field games. 
Paul in his letters refers to running the good race or having run a good race. In this crowd, it would have been woven out of leaves and twigs with leaves on them. Here, though, it says that these Stephanus were of gold. Indicates that the elders have been rewarded for victory that had been accomplished. The previous chapter, chapter 3, has some interesting things to say about the throne, the white clothing, and the gold crowns. We'll look at these all three together, one right after the other one. First is in Revelation 3, 5. He who wins the victory, like them, will be dressed in white clothing, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life. In fact, I will acknowledge him individually before my Father and his angels. Then Revelation 3, 21. I will let him who wins the victory set with me on my throne, just as I myself won the victory and sat down with my father on his throne. And then Revelation 3.18, My advice to you is to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white clothing so that you may be dressed and not have to be ashamed of your nakedness. And I salve to rub on your eyes so that you may see. This is a quick review of what we've already been through. And these that we've just looked at are the victors in the last chapter. So it would seem that these 24 elders could very well be representative of those who win the victory down through the ages, those who have won the good race, both in the time before the advent of Messiah and in the time after his advent. Also to be considered as we look at these is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, please. How dare one of you with a complaint against another go to court before pagan judges and not before God's people? Don't you know that God's people are going to judge the universe? If you're going to judge the universe, are you incompetent to judge these minor matters? Don't you know that we will judge angels, not to mention affairs of everyday life? See, we have these thrones, and there might be a connection to judging the universe if we have these thrones, to judging angels if we have these thrones. This could very well be one of the aspects of these thrones that we'll have. Those thrones are symbols of authority. And believers are going to judge the universe and judge angels, obviously fallen angels. Let's look at uh, then ahead again, uh, Revelation chapter 4, verses 5 through about midpoint in verse 6. From the throne, that's the throne in the center, came forth lightnings, voices, and thunders, and before the throne were seven flaming torches, which are the sevenfold spirit of God. In front of the throne was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. We have these thrones. It's interesting. We're going to be in thrones surrounding that throne from which all this has just come. There's detail here that we should take note of, and that the throne is not the originator of the flashes of lightning or the voices of the thunderings. It's not the throne that initiates this. The flashes of lightning are identified with God and his characteristics. Let's go to Exodus 19. This is Moses has led the children up to the Mount Horeb, to the mountain of God, and God is about to appear before them. So we'll pick this up in Exodus 19.16. On the morning of the third day there was thunder, lightning, and a thick cloud on the mountain. Then a shofar blast sounded so loudly that all the people in the camp trembled. Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood near the base of the mountain. This lightning and thunder are associated with the presence of God. God appears to Israel accompanied by lightning and thunder. In the scene here before John, we have lightning and thunder. The lightning and thunder are another indication to us that the someone who is in, on the throne is Almighty God himself, the same one that showed up in the cloud with lightning and thunder before the children of Israel. The language indicates this. From this throne came lightning and voices and thunderings, and before the throne were seven flaming torches. 
seven flaming torches identified as the sevenfold spirit of God. Some translations that you're perhaps looking at will say the seven spirits of God. Back in Revelation um, chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, the same expression is used. So let's take a look at that again, if you will, please. Revelation 1, 4 and 5. From Yochanan, John, to the seven messianic communities in the province of Asia, grace and shalom to you from the one who is, who was, and who is coming, from the sevenfold spirit before his throne. And from Yeshua, the Messiah, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of earth's kings, to him, the one who loves us, who has freed us from our sins at the cost of his blood. Note how this identification is made here in the beginning of the verses that we're going to be looking at. First, it is one who is and who was and who is coming. Then there's a sevenfold spirit, and this is a singular form of Hebrew. There's a sevenfold spirit before his throne, and finally, Yeshua Messiah. We've looked at this earlier. So, we seem to have then seen the Father, the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, and the Son indicated as being part of who we're encountering in Revelation. Here in chapter 4, we have introduced someone who is sitting on the throne. This would be Almighty God, God the Father. Now, as we look more into chapter 4, we're introducing the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, although some don't believe that. In Revelation chapter 5, verses 5 and 6, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, that appeared to have been slaughtered, will be introduced. Here in Revelation 4, 5, the sevenfold Spirit is being introduced as it was in chapter 1. It's being introduced here in Revelation 4, 5 as being before the throne of God. Some don't think this is speaking of the Holy Spirit. It's just speaking of seven angels. I believe it is speaking of a sevenfold spirit that is the Holy Spirit. It seems to me like that who is being introduced really is the Holy Spirit. The blazing fire here, in my opinion, is a metaphor for the empowerment of that spirit. Seven blazing torches, which are the sevenfold spirit of God. Keeping that in mind, let's look at Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. The festival of Shavuot arrived. It's called Pentecost in the church. It's 50. Pentecost is 50 in Greek. Shavuot is 50 in Hebrew. The festival of Shavuot arrived, and the believers all gathered together in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from the sky like the roar of violent wind and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then they saw what looked like tongues of fire, which separated and came to rest on each of them. They were all filled with the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, and began to talk in different languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. Here in Acts, Ruach HaKodesh is described as tongues of fire. Which separated and came to rest on each of them. So what is a torch? What is a torch? A tongue of fire. A torch is a tongue of fire. Seven of them here in Revelation 4 5 as separated blazes representing a singular Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit separated to fall on each of the believers that were at the temple on Shavuot, it would have been even more likely that the seven individual blazes would have been multiplied. But seven is a number of fullness or a number of wholeness or a number of completion. So here we have seven blazing torches, which are the sevenfold spirit of God, seven being the number of completeness. I think this is talking about the fullness of the Holy Spirit being represented here in Revelation. These seven blazing torches, which are the sevenfold Spirit of God being before the throne, indicates the empowerment of the Spirit as an element of God's reign. The Holy Spirit 
is going to be there in power with God. The empowerment that the Spirit can give, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, as we saw it in Acts chapter 2, will be an element of God's reign. The absolute authority of God and the transforming power of the Holy Spirit are closely connected. You can't separate the absolute power and the authority of God and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. They're integrated and they can't be separated. Those that sit on the thrones around God cannot reign with Him without His empowerment. Just like the empowerment of the Holy Spirit is there also at the throne of God and the source of their empowerment will be the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh. Seven flaming torches, which are the sevenfold Spirit of God. All right, moving ahead. Revelation 4, 6, please. In front of the throne was what looked like a sea of glass. In the center around the throne were four living beings covered with eyes in front and behind. This is a scene which is essentially not duplicated in human experience. And it's believed that John is using a figure of speech to really describe what he saw here. I can tell you that seeing a sea of glass clear as a crystal is extremely unusual. But I tell you that I remember seeing San Carlos Bay one time during a period of extending calm, San Carlos Bay is between Sanibel and the mouth of the Caloosahatchee, Ponderosa. No causeway in place as a windbreak or anything back in those days. I can remember seeing San Carlos Bay when there wasn't a ripple on it. It was smooth as glass. And it was impressive. It was impressive. Smooth and flat. Just like a sheet of glass. And that's a most exceptional event to see a body of water over three miles across, smooth as glass. John is talking about a sea of glass. When I read that and remembered how that bay looked, the impression I got was John was talking here about the sea of glass as indicating a great calm. A great calm. Under God there will be a great calm take place as he comes and begins his rule and comes and rules that there will be nothing, absolutely nothing disturbing, that there's absolutely nothing or anyone capable of disturbing the great calm stretching out before the presence of God's throne. And John saw this. John got a look at it. There was no doubt about that. This is visual input. God's revealing to him, to John, These matters that may very well not exist in time and space, putting them in such a way, putting them in such a way that John, who does exist in time and space, can comprehend them and understand them. Now, there are a couple of interesting references to look at here. So let's begin by going to Exodus 24.10, please. And they saw the God of Israel. And under his feet was something like a sapphire stone pavement as clear as the sky itself. This is at Horeb, the mountain of God. This is during the time of the giving of Torah. And God has invited the 70 elders, Moses, Aaron, and Aaron's two sons, to come up on the mountain before him. And as they go up on the mountain, they stop at a level just below him. And they look up. And they're under his feet, and they see his feet through a sapphire stone pavement as clear as the sky itself. Is this that same sapphire stone pavement that the light of God is coming through, the throne of God from, that's being talked about in Revelation? To me, this is fascinating. So here we have an identification of the God of Israel with this expanse at his throne like a clear glass, although it's a sapphire stone pavement. Also, we need to look in Ezekiel chapter 1. We'll look in verses 22 and 26. Ezekiel has been taken to the presence of God inside the cloud in a vision, and this is part of what he saw. 
Ezekiel 1.22 says, He saw over the heads of the living creatures was what appeared to be a dome glittering like ice. It was awesome spread out over their heads above them. Now pause right there. This is kind of the same event that those with Moses and Aaron and the 70 elders and the two sons of Aaron went up and looked up and saw God above them, kind of in his dome with this sapphire pavement underneath. You can apply that to this, I believe. Then skipping ahead in Ezekiel 1 to verse 26, above the dome that was over their head was something like a throne, aha, uh -huh, that looked like a sapphire. See, looking through what Moses had looked through, that's what Ezekiel's looking through. On and above it was what appeared to be a person. And if we remember from the verse before that, where they looked up, they saw his feet, what appeared to be a person. All this builds together. Scripture moves in a circle. Moves in a circle. Ezekiel's been taken into the presence of God inside the cloud in a vision. John has seen what he saw as a sea of grass. Moses saw what looked like an expanse of emerald stone pavement. Emerald is transparent. An expanse of emerald glass. Remember the color of the rainbow John saw around the throne in verse 3? Emerald. Ezekiel describes what he saw as glittering ice. And it was transparent. He could see through it. He could see the throne and the person on the throne. That's some of the ways that people have seen the throne of God describe what's there that they saw. Some people, Latter-day scholars, refer to it as the great waters of the earth. Some locate this between the first and the second heavens. Others think it refers to the laver in the Solomon's temple, which was called the sea because of its side. Do we understand when I say la laver what they're talking about? There was a huge tank, and we'll get through this in a minute, but there was a huge tank just outside the temple next to the sacrifice altar that was filled with water. And the priests, before they would go to the Lord, would go to this place and bathe themselves. At the very minimum, if they were bathed and dressed in white, already washed their hands and feet. Now, let's look at this. Beginning in 1 Kings 7.23, please. He made the cast metal sea circular 17 and a half feet from rim to rim, 8 and 3 quarters feet high and 52 and a half feet in circumference. It was pretty big. Some people think that John, what John saw refers to this great labor where the priest washed her hands and feet for ritual purity. I don't think so. That's just me. But you might run into this. People have some unique ideas. We had a guest come some oh, 17 or 18 years ago when we were studying through this same area who wanted us to buy the theory that the 24 elders were the 12 sons of Jacob and the 12 sons of Ishmael. We were very polite. We didn't accept that theory in light of the current situation between the sons of Israel and the sons of Ishmael. But we need to notice John's language here. He doesn't say that he saw a sea of glass, but that it was what looked like a sea of glass. It was what looked like a sea of glass, further qualified as being clear as a crystal. Now, there are various ideas as to what this symbolizes. One thought is that glass in the ancient days was usually dark and opaque, or close to opaque, and clear glass, clear as a crystal, was very, very rare and enormously expensive because most glass was dark and opaque. So clear glass, clear as a crystal, was very rare and enormously expensive. So if you had a sea of this, its value would be beyond calculation. That's what's being written into this, is that this sea of glass 
that the Lord is preparing for us has a value beyond calculation. We'll never quite ever be able to understand that in this life. Certainly a material that would be suitable for a royal court. Now then, some then see this as a reservoir of evil. How's that for a 180 degree turn? <laughs> some of this see this as a reservoir of evil out of which arose a monster. And they're particularly referring here to Revelation 13.1 when they make this call. It says, And I saw a beast come up out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, and on its horns were ten royal crowns, and on its heads blasphemous names. This is talking about the introduction of the beasts that we're going to look at and study in some depth coming along. The beasts being the false messiah and the false prophet. And some people want to take this particular verse out of Revelation 13 and make it apply to the crystal glass sea that God's talking about presenting and making available to us, which we see as nothing but purity. Other people, <laughs> people are interesting, other people take the position that it is a symbol of God's absolute holiness, and I agree with that symbolizing a sense of separateness. None of us can approach God as we are, and this is a shining ocean that bars that approach. It emphasizes the majesty and holiness of God. Others see this is a sea of humanity in perfect harmony with God. Others see this is a sea of humanity in perfect harmony with God without a ripple of trouble in the waters. People see this passage and interpret it in a whole lot of different ways. Sometimes I think people feel compelled to give some kind of an interpretation, whether they know anything or not. All right. Still in Revelation chapter 4, we're going to pick up about midway through verse 6 and go on to verse 7. In the center, around the throne were four living beings covered with eyes in front and behind. And the first living being was like a lion. The second living being was like an ox. The third living being had a face that looked human. And the fourth living being was like a flying eagle. I want you to notice that that third living being is stated only as had a face that looked human, not being like a human only had a face only had a face that looked human and i'm going to say that boy this is very interesting because it may emphasize the statement made at the beginning of the chapter when john saw someone john saw someone here attention is directed at the four living creatures that are positioned in the center around the throne these four living creatures are described as beings that are in close relationship with God. They are around the throne, indicating that they serve God. It says that there were four living creatures, and the fact that there were four may be related to a concept of totality. This number appeared when we studied Zechariah. So go back and look at that for just a minute about this number four being a concept of totality. Zechariah 6, 1 through 5. Again, Zechariah speaking, I raised my eyes and I saw in front of me four chariots coming out from between two mountains and the mountains were mountains of bronze. First chariot had red horses, second chariot black horses, third chariot white horses, and the fourth chariot spotted gray horses. I asked the angel speaking with me, What are these, my Lord? And the angel answered me, These are the four winds of the sky that go out after pre presenting themselves before the Lord of all the land. What do the four winds of the sky represent? Wind blowing from every possible direction. These four indicate totality. Four horses in Zechariah chapter 1, and the four 
horns and the four artisans of Zechariah chapter 2, which we're not going to take the time to look at, give the same kind of indication. Here, in Revelation 4, 6 and 7, the four living creatures are described differently than the one sitting on the throne. The one sitting on the throne is identified as someone. Write that down. The one sitting on the throne is identified as someone. Each of the four living creatures surrounding the throne are described as something. Described as something. See the difference? Difference between someone and something. Someone, even though greatly different from a human, is put in the context of someone that we are like. The four living creatures are put in the context of something that we are different than, even though we are also living creatures. Notice this. John didn't say that he saw something sitting on the throne. He saw someone sitting on the throne that he declined to describe other than in terms of that someone sitting on the throne's brilliance. That's what we have gotten, is that light that's emanating from there through the glass that we're looking at. Here John is describing the four somethings around the throne in fairly great detail for us. He doesn't identify with them in the same manner as he identifies with the one at the center of the throne. So we have to keep thinking about that. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, in the likeness of ourselves, and let them rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, the animals, and over all the earth, and over every crawling creature that crawls on the earth. So God created humankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. All right. We all should know that by heart now. You've heard it enough times. Let's take that then to Genesis 5, 1 through 3. Here's the genealogy of Adam. On the day that God created man, he made them in the likeness of God. He created the male and female. He blessed them and called them Adam, humankind or man on the day they were created. After Adam lived 130 years, he fathered a son like himself and named him Seth, or Shet in the Hebrew. Now, what's interesting about this is there's two Hebrew words used in these verses. Genesis 1, 26 and 27, and Genesis 5, 1 through 3. And they both mean almost the same thing likeness, image, so forth. One of these words used is demut, demut, which is found not only in Genesis 1.26, but also in Genesis 5.3, where it talks about the son of Adam, Seth. Demut is likeness. The other word is salim, salim, which is image, follows the same pattern, these same words that describe man being made in God's image and likeness are also used in describing Seth being made in Adam's image and likeness. When John saw someone on the throne instead of something on the throne, there was a likeness to the image that we are familiar with in us, that we're created like. Likeness and image does not mean an exact clone. Remember that likeness and image does not mean an exact clone. My human father and I have some dissimilarities, but I am in his image and likeness. If any kind of other created creature had been seated on the throne, it would not have been in the image of God. It would not have been someone sitting on the throne it would have been something sitting on the throne. I'm harping on this. I really want us to take this away. John was conscious of someone sitting on the throne, and I think this had to be God. This has to be qualified because man has fallen. 
I don't think man in his natural state could see anyone on the throne. But John could, because he was taken out of his natural state to be before that throne and to be able to see this. But on the other hand, look at 1 Corinthians 2.14. Now the natural man does not receive the things from the Spirit of God. To him they are nonsense. Moreover, he is unable to grasp them because they are evaluated through the Spirit. The natural man does not have the Spirit existing in him. We're talking about the common guy walking down the street out there. But John was no longer a natural man here. He was a believer indwelled by the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh. There are two reasons that he could identify the figure on the throne as someone. He, John, was made in the image of God and filled with the Holy Spirit. Two, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. You see those two together? He, John, was made in the image of God. He was indwelled by the Holy Spirit. John knew what he was looking for. John knew what he was looking for, and what he saw was evaluated by the Ruach dwelling in him. These two things in combination are important. But here he sees only living creatures are living beings. They're described as living beings. Why living beings? That seems almost like a redundancy. Why not just beings? This may relate them to the creation of God, if they're living beings. See, in God there is life. The creation of God is living. The term land of the living, for instance, is used numerous times throughout the Old Testament. That they are beings indicates something created not clearly identifiable with man. Some believe that these were possibly the cherubim, also known as the cherubim in the Hebrew. Let's look at Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 2. He spoke to the man clothed in white linen. Go in between. This is the angel or the representative of God. He spoke to the man clothed in linen. He said, Go in between the wheels under the caravim. Fill both your hands with fiery coals between the caravim and throw them on the city. I watched as he went. See, this is probably the same way that Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. The angels went in and took the coals from between the wheels wheels of the Kerevim and tossed them down on the two cities that God wanted destroyed. While we're in Ezekiel, let's go to Ezekiel 1, 5 through 11 for the description of these Kerevim. Inside, there appeared to be four living creatures that looked like human beings. Aha, uh -huh. look at the description of these now. Each one had four faces and four wings, or legs were straight with feet like calves' hooves. They glittered like burnished bronze. Under their wings they had human hands on the four sides. The four of them had faces and wings as follows. They touched one another with their wings. They did not turn when they moved, but each one moved straight ahead. I want you to think of the four of these standing, each facing in one direction, but all holding hands so that each one was looking in a specific direction probably over the one in front of him. And so, whichever direction they moved, one of them was facing in that direction. Next. As for the appearance of their faces, they had human faces in front. Each head of the four had a lion's face on the right. Each of the four had a bull's face on the left. And each of the four had an eagle's face towards the rear. So as they're standing there holding this, all the human faces are facing in one direction. All the lion faces are facing in one direction. All the ox faces are facing in one direction. Are we following this? Okay. Thus their faces, as for their wings, each had two that stretched upward and joined those of the others. That's how they were holding hands, if you will, or touching wings and two more that covered their bodies. 
Wow. Here in our text in Revelation, each of these creatures had only one face. But they're the same faces that we've just looked at here. Human, lion, bull or ox, and eagle. And there's belief that these are celestial representatives of God's animate creation. With each creature symbolizing the highest and noblest in a particular category as used from the perspective of giving glory to God. Each creature symbolizing the highest and noblest in a particular category is used from the perspective of giving glory to God. Now these are just theories. The eagle refers to the swiftest, the bull the strongest, the lion the noblest, and the man the wisest, and I would take umbrage with that perhaps. These and other speculations surround these creatures. However, what can be said about these creatures is, these creatures, in view of their closeness to the throne, they are important and to some extent represent the whole creation, and that the creature and the creation will participate in the redemption of all things. Now, these living beings are first described as being covered with eyes front and back, symbolizing that they are all seeing, collecting information, our eyes towards both God and towards creation, perhaps. Nothing escapes their attention. Their sleeplessness and vigilance, which we'll see in verse 8, is also a thought. Nothing in creation is hidden from God's sight. We've been through this before. Everything is uncovered, laid bare to him who we must give our account to. That thought is here in this again. Remember the horses and riders of Zechariah chapter 1? Some kind of vigilance over everything. They came directly from the throne. We studied that out, if you remember in Zechariah, they came out from between the mountains. They were coming out from the throne. Verse 7, verse 7 continues to describe living beings. The first living being was like a lion, the second like an ox, the third had a face like a man, the fourth was like a flying eagle. It's interesting that in early church times there were writers that identified these creatures with the four gospel writers. Matthew was the man, Mark was the eagle, Luke was the ox, and John was the lion. These were very popular in the early church, even up into later times. There's really no basis for such an identification. These are wholly speculative and fanciful, but popular. Note that these are described as being like an ox or an eagle, but the creature identified as the third one just had a face like a man. It's almost like three of the creatures had bodies and heads like animals, but the third creature's body is not identified. Only that he had a face like a man. The creatures described in Ezekiel are similar but different. But then I'm not sure how clear my description would be if I were thrust into the position of having to make this description to you guys. One thing I can tell you from my time with the police department as a, a crime scene investigating officer, descriptions of the same theme will vary with each person who was there, sometimes widely. We learned in Ezekiel 10.2 that these beings are associated with the outpouring of God's wrath. The coal, the embers, from among the fire that was tossed in the city, the coal from the fires, the embers from the fire among them was tossed on the city. Notice that these beings are in the center and around the throne. When we get into chapter 6, we're going to see this. In fact, let's, let's run ahead um, and, and give you a quick preview. Revelation 6, 1 through 7, please. <laughs> says, Next, I watched as the Lamb broke the first of the seven seals. And I heard one of the four living creatures say in a thundering voice, Go! I looked, and there in front of me was a white horse, a rider with a bow 
was given a crown and he rode off as a conqueror to conquer. When he broke the second seal, I heard the second living being saying, Go! Another horse went out, a red one, and its rider was given the power to take peace away from the earth, make people slaughter each other. He was given a great sword. Next. When he broke the third seal, I heard the third living being saying, Go! And I looked, and in front of me was a black horse, and its rider held in his hand a pair of scales. That's going to be an interesting discussion right there when we get to it. Six. Then I heard what sounded like a voice from among the four living beings saying, Two pounds of wheat for a day's wages, six pounds of barley for the same price, but don't damage the oil and wine. When he broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the four living beings say, Go. Well, we have these four living beings that are going to be actively involved in the judgment of God. And that's what that's talking about when those seals are broken. They're being loosed to bring judgment. Then in Revelation 15, 5 through 8, After this I looked, and the sanctuary, that is the tent of witness in heaven, was opened. And out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues. They were dressed in clean bright linen and had gold belts around their chests. One of the four living beings gave the seven angels seven gold bowls filled with fury of God who lives forever and ever next. Then the sanctuary was filled with smoke from God's Shekinah, that is, from his power, and no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels had accomplished their purpose. No one, listen to this, no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels had accomplished their purpose. There will be no pre-tribulation event. Until the tribulation is complete, no one will be able to enter that sanctuary where God is. Says so. Right there. Revelation 15, 5 through 8. Now, that's a couple of sneak previews for you. These living beings are in the center and around the throne that we've just looked at. That's a very interesting concept that's around here. The four living beings, the ones that are holding hands or touching wings, if you will, and each faced and they're moving, but they're all around the throne so that the throne is in the center between them so that they only move when the throne moves. Build that one in. Very interesting concept. Well, that's going to be it for tonight. Next week we'll pick this up in verse 8 again, and we'll continue with the description of these living beings.